I mean, we see the most proactive forces like uh, Essex and Merseyside catching significantly more drug drivers than drink. Um, just an interesting one uh, earlier this year, Merseyside went public with their detection figures for 2019 um, to help to array, raise awareness with the public and with businesses. So for 2019, this produced uh, 1,500 drink drive prosecutions, which was a record for Merseyside, but over 2,000 drug drive arrests. 2,000 in one of the 44 forces of, of the UK. You do the maths. Does that get people's attention? Um, does that increase the focus of transport managers watching that 50% of those 2,000 drug driver arrests drove for work and were actually, or were actually driving for work at the time? That's, uh, yeah, that's shocking. staggering, isn't it? Yeah, five years ago, that metric from Merseyside was, was still bad at 20%, but it shows you the, the, the increase in that period of time. I mean, we, we've talked uh, about it for uh, a short while ago. Um, Paul, perhaps, is do you anticipate we may see people trying to combat fatigue by looking at maybe drugs to help on that? Is that something you have experience with? Uh, yes, I have. Um... I've been involved in a number of cases where professional drivers were either using recreational drugs on their rest days and who then experienced problems of fatigue when they returned to work. Uh, for example, use of stimulant drugs such as amphetamines and cocaine uh, results in rebound fatigue. Uh, so after the, the days of, of drug use, a responsible individual may stop using drugs because they're going back to work but then experience problems of what we call rebound fatigue where the effects of the drugs have worn off and that has been replaced with profound drowsiness which can affect them when they're driving. In addition to that I think there's another issue here which is an associated problem of drivers, professional drivers sometimes, using stimulant drugs to help them cope with their workload. Um, and this isn't about recreational drug use, it's about individuals doing something to help them stay awake. Um, we've heard of taxi drivers, for example, who uh, frequently use cocaine and stimulants, other stimulants such as amphetamines, to help them stay awake for longer periods. Um, and even outside of uh, illicit drugs, you could even extend that to the use of energy drinks. Um, you know, which are still a stimulant um, and excessive use of um, any kind of stimulant, be it caffeine or any illicit substance, is likely to have an impact on uh, impairment. If, um, what, what are the ramifications for an employee if, uh, if, if they're caught? So um, I've seen a couple of stories recently. There were a, a number over the Christmas period that I remember. One in particular where I think someone was driving a, um, a, a waste tanker and I think they were, they were both found to have drugs and alcohol in their system, rolled, rolled the tanker having nearly killed someone uh, and the company had a massive fine and there was one, an incident recently where a, uh, a delivery driver uh, was in an incident and, and on suspicion of drug driving. What, what are the ramifications for the drivers if they do this? Um, the, the ramifications, um, you, you've, you've, you've got everything from the unexplained incidents of knocking off a, a mirror on a bus um, through to the vehicle downtime. Um, and associate, associated costs. There's the employee injury, um, third party, innocent third party injury, or even death. So companies should screen for drugs and alcohol to help prevent this. And another angle is that as a, as a transport manager or as a director of a company, you, you would need to defend yourself in, 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 a, in a court case. Um, but as for the driver, there's, there's, there's everything from personal injury, loss of uh, prosecution for, for drug driving by the police, um, loss of their license, and the consequences thereof of, of, of no job. 
um, it, it, it can become endless. So uh, it is quite an important subject for both the driver and the company. Yes. I mean, Paul, a question you mentioned about the high caffeine drinks, which I think a lot of people, whether they uh, are fatigued um, and driving, because as you said, with taxi drivers and things like that, uh, we also hear during this challenging period, a lot of people have sleep problems. Mm. If we're looking at over the counter uh, drugs that are maybe available, I mean, the implications, and perhaps this is a question for both of you. Um, you know this is something they need to notify the employer of if it's impeding their ability but um, what would the guidance and what would your advice be let's maybe start with yourself Paul on these over the over the counter type um, drugs <clears throat> well I think um, both prescription and over the counter medicines there's a whole range of both of those groups of substances which can have a negative impact on uh, sleep quality but also on daytime drowsiness I think with prescription drugs, clearly they have been prescribed by a medical professional, and so there is less likely to be uh, an issue of lack of information available. With over-the-counter medicines, I think there is a, a bigger problem here in as much as um, many of the substances, particularly older style um, medicines, such as older style antihistamines, which are used to treat things like hay fever and other allergies, which are used to treat colds and coughs and flu. Um, many of these substances under a different name are also used to treat sleep problems. So they have a profound sedating effect. And I think it's un unrecognized or not well recognized, particularly within the driving community, um, just how significant an impact those substances can have upon their driving capabilities and performance. So um, one of the things I think employers should be looking at is providing proper information to their driving workforce on safer alternatives. And that might be in the form of a simple information leaflet um, with pictures of medicines which are recommended and those which are, shouldn't be uh, recommended for drivers. Um, but we also have to think about those individuals who are using medicines to treat sleep problems. Some of those can have a, a very long lasting effect. Uh, so, you know, you've got a whole range of, of potential consequences, either stimulant drugs, which cause problems the day after their use through to sedating medicines, which cause daytime drowsiness. Um, you know, there's a whole range there. So proper information for drivers, provided by the employer, I think is an essential first step. I mean, Ian, Ian, from your side, I mean, would you, I mean, recommend companies can, to be as vigilant as they have always been? So we've seen perhaps some companies looking to relax some of their testing side. What would your advice be there? Um, my suggestion would be um, there's no holiday with health and safety. Um, you, you need to, to get back to this. Um, we, we had a, um, a very good, we've been talking around with many of our customers to see how we can help. And one of the, an excellent example was from Nottingham Express Transit, um, Nottingham Tram. They made it very clear in a statement that said, under the health and safety governance, they are required to continue with safety critical monitoring and fulfill safety audits. There are no exceptions. And I thought that was an excellent way of, of putting the message across. Um, but going back to the medicines, one of the most prevalent that we see uh, is the codeine. And it's, it's a synthetic form of, of opium or heroin. Um, and it still has some of the downsides of heroin. Firstly, it's one of the most addictive medications on the planet. And it causes significant impairment. And as the body gets used to the dose that you've been put on, that level of impairment might wane, but the addiction for more increases. So as more is taken, the level of impairment returns, and that's an upward spiral. So uh, we, can, we can highlight that consumption by screening. And the lab 
the lab systems, they can clearly confirm which particular type of um, opiate it is. And they can also see whether it's above what would sensibly be seen as a therapeutic dose. So we can see if a, if, if a driver is taking this for, for pain medication uh, or whether they've become addicted to it and need some sort of other guidance, um, even to the extent of back to their GP. Um, one of the, the key things is that medicines that can or do impair should be declared to an employer, a risk assessment made, and maybe the driver retasked for a while. Um, it's back to our, our system of, of having a policy and then educate. So there's a big part of policy, educate, deter, detect. The detection bit is what most people focus on or they hide behind a paper policy that has no action. And in reality, it's a system. You need the policy, you need to educate the people why drinking drugs don't mix with driving. Um, and we have the deterrence with, with the system and we detect, we detect to look back to see if we've done enough of the first steps, policy and education. Um, and that really does depend on the company and how much effort they put in. So uh, there's no holiday. Can, can I pick up on that point around uh, the driver um, engagement and come back to you, Paul, in your uh, sort of experience as a psychologist? What are the major challenges here because in a work environment where you can be identified uh, for this you, I guess people are much less likely uh, to own up to having a problem and if the company is going to instigate some kind of checking procedure or uh, uh, around that what, what are the challenges in in driver engagement and communication well, I think just the nature of the driving workforce that's the, the starting point to the challenges you have a group of individuals who are relatively isolated from the rest of the from the business on a daily basis they have limited contact with their management on a day-to-day -day basis um, they're highly distributed uh, so just from a starting point you've got you know some challenges there how do you engage with those individuals um, they may be uh, operating at times of the day when the rest of the business isn't active for example if they're doing early morning shifts they may be out on the road at 4 30 in the morning um, or traveling through the night so just those practical issues can be a challenge um, the workforce driving workforce is predominantly male still we know that men aren't particularly good at being uh, uh, coming forward with issues um, of a whole range um, this is just one of many. Uh, so, yeah, I think there are some major practical challenges for, for managers and employers generally. What, what about you, Ian? What, what do you see uh, as the challenges your customers have to face? Um, a few years ago, I would have said um, from the innocent majority that we've heard many reports from employees thanking the company for sorting out the problem caused by the not so innocent minority. Um, so with that, driver engagement was always fantastic. However, um, with the, the more recent police experience of more drugs than drink, this has highlighted the, the magnitude of drug driving in the workplace. Um, there's no longer a defense of burying your head in the sand, um, hiding behind a written policy. A, a judge would now want to see the record of actions that every party has been involved in and the practical use of um, that particular policy. Um, I, th I think there's, there's a situation where companies possibly need to, to pay heed to this situation and have a look at uh, a higher level of engagement. And at that point, again, it's down to explaining to drivers what's, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Mm. So, it, I mean, it sounds from that that actually grabbing the nettle and dealing with the issue can be a positive thing by rooting out what, you know, could be a small element within your business. You actually strengthen the culture within the, uh, the remaining employees, I guess. So, uh, Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 